Hello everyone, welcome to this UK Data Service webinar on the Twitter timeline. Your presenter today will be Peter Smythe of the University of Manchester. So what we're going to be looking at today is just a timeline, but there are various aspects of it and things we need to set up before we can actually get any data. So basically this is the, 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 the lineup. We're going to look at the keys in authentication. Um, I think it goes without saying that in order to get any use the, the Twitter API, you need a Twitter account as well. Um, but the keys in auth authentication is an addition to your Twitter account. We're going to look at the, uh, well, I'm going to mention the new API and the developer account or the academic account that should really be. I would say at the outset, I'm going to try and do this um, entirely in a non-technical sense in that we won't actually be seeing the code, but we will be seeing the results of having run the code. So, so for non-technical persons, you should be able to follow along quite happily with this. So, but things like API, I can't really avoid mentioning at some point. Um, we need to actually decide what is and what isn't in a user's timeline. It's not what we can actually get and what a user would actually see on the screen aren't quite the same things. And that's a bit unfortunate because there's lots of things on the screen which we can't actually get from the API. But we can do a better job than simply getting a, a simple um, individual user's timeline. So we'll go through the process of extracting a complete timeline. Now here, when I'm using the word timeline, I tend to, I'm tend to use it in two different senses. One is um, an individual's timeline, i.e. what they would see if they were looking at their Twitter account. Um, but timeline is also used in the API to mean the tweets of an individual user. Or, or actually, three, the 3,200 most recent tweets of that user. In fact, that's only telling you part of the story because it's missing out things which they see uh, on their screen. And the idea is for us to con construct a timeline is to include all of the tweets of the user plus all of the tweets that they see from other users who they they have they're following. So this is what I mean by extract the complete timeline. Uh, while avoiding the API rate limits, well, again, that, um, we're not really going to discuss the API rate limits. They exist, but again, most of the code that you use will have ways of getting around it or waiting for it and what have you. So it's not really an issue we need to concern ourselves with um, today. There's, um, if you need to write code to get timelines, I get a lot of tweets in a short period of time or the shortest period of time as possible. There's lots of code examples of how you um, manage the API rate limits, which are imposed by Twitter. And basically all you do is you wait until it fails. It says you fail because you're, you're, you've reached a rate limit. It will actually tell you at what time you can commence asking for tweets again. So it's, it's a very simple process of avoiding the rate limits. You don't really avoid them. You just run into them and then wait and then run in, into the next one. Um, having collected all of the, the data that we need, the next thing we're going to need to do is actually do a bit of stitching of things together because we're going to have to collect the data in, in various little parts. And even, even for your own timeline, it comes in parts that you're going to have, we're going to have to put together in order to make anything usable at the end. Um, I'll mention conversations rather briefly towards the end because, again, that's a, um, it's something which is made a bit better with the new API, but it still leaves um, a lot of work for you to do in actually putting things together should you need to do so. In some use case scenarios, you may not need to bother with that, but in others, it, it will be quite important. And although you get a bit of help with the new API, you're still going to end up having to stick things together. We'll come. I'll give an example of that later on. Uh, and then at the end, having got it all together, well, what, what are you going to do with it? Because quite frankly, when you've constructed this timeline of what the user sees, it's really just a very long list of records. 
a very large data set. If you think, if you take, um, I'll, I'll show you the figures later on, but if you take the, the UK data service, if I asked for just the timeline of the UK data service, I'd get 3,200 tweets. Three, so that's 3,200 rows. But the data service follows over 3,000 other accounts. So when I've got, if I had the complete line, timelines of all of them, I'm going to end up with well over a million rows of data. And that's not something that you want to look at on the screen. So at the back of your mind, before you start any of this, um, you really have to have some kind of idea of what is it you're going to use this data for. And I'll, I'll give you a few little minute examples at the end. Keys and authentication. It has been simplified with the latest API. API version 2 started, I think, about January last year. But API version 1.1 is still commonly used. Um, API version 2 has simplified things slightly in that it uses a thing called a bearer token for access. Um, makes it a bit easier, but you still have to get one before you start. And before you can even get that far, you still need a Twitter account. So if you're thinking of getting Twitter timelines, make sure you've got a Twitter account. Um, any request you make to the API, you've got to include your, in, in this case for version two, the bearer token. Um, I've just mentioned, yes, currently version one, 1 1.1 and version two are both running together. Um, I don't know how old 1.1 is, it's quite a few years old now. Um, version two is still being developed, simpler to use. Um, they have, they've got quite a good little website telling you how to use it and code examples and what have you. And I, I noticed in the last couple of weeks that they started boasting how they've now got, in addition to examples in Ruby and, and Python, they've now got some R examples as well. So depending on what your programming language is, you should be able to find some code to help you out there. Um, we're going to assume it's not really relevant because as I say, I'm not going to show you any code particularly, but most of the work, everything, the results I'm going to show you have all come from using the version two of the API. So I said, doesn't matter for today. Um, yeah. Just on the old system, it's still around. You can still use it. You can still use it if you've got version two keys. Um, if you have old keys and legacy code, that's still going to work perfectly fine. Um, I haven't seen anything about saying when it's going to shut down. I would imagine that it will run for a, a couple of years more yet. Um, the downside of the new version at the moment is that some of the um, programming language packages haven't been updated for it yet. Some have, some haven't, but you can always fall back on using basic um, API calls from virtually any language you like. What do you get in the new system? You get a nice little dashboard which tells you how many tweets you've downloaded on a monthly basis. And I guess part of the reason to do that is because um, you're limited in, um, your account is limited to either 500,000 tweets per month, or if you have an academic account, which I would recommend, you can have up to 10 million tweets per month. And that might seem to be a very large number until you start downloading people's timelines because it, it involves an awful lot of tweets to download. Um, this, this is only, this point only really relevant if you've used version 1.1 because some of the endpoints have changed and there's changes to the way the data is delivered. The main difference between the data, the way the data is delivered is that in version 1.1, if you ask for a tweet, it told you everything about that tweet. Anything it had on that tweet, it was sent down the line to you. Whereas on version two, you have to say what data you want returned. By default, if you ask for a tweet, all you get is the tweet ID, the created time, and the text of the tweet. And the text of the tweet itself is a bit misleading because it's not necessarily going to be the full text of the tweet. But we'll go into that later on. From a position where you could just ask for the tweet and then decide what you wanted to extract from them, now you're going to have to um, plan a bit more ahead and decide what it is you want the tweet to return. Because you can certainly get into a situation where you haven't got all of the information that you're, going to, you're potentially going to need. 
just as a little example, this is um, taken from um, an old, uh, this is from a version one call to the API and returning a tweet. Uh, this is from a guy called Donald J. Trump. And it's, it's not really about Donald J. Trump. This is about all the different fields that you can get coming back. Now, a lot of these fields, or some of the, half of them say, are, are quite useful and, and almost essential. So you'll almost certainly want the created that. That's okay, that's still available. The ID string, which is the, the unique identifier for the tweet, which you're gonna use, not, not in its own right, but should you ever need to go back and get this tweet again, then that is how you would reference this tweet. You get this thing, called, uh, well, this has changed slightly in the new system, but you used to get this thing called full text. And here you seem to be getting the text of the tweet. Now, as this is a short text, a shorter tweet, you do in fact have the full tweet text there. But there are situations where it'll say full text, and in fact, you haven't got the full text. If this was a retweet, it would start off with RT followed by the whoever the original tweet came from, and then it would have the text of the tweet. So if you think about it, if someone has used their limit in a tweet of 280 characters, and then someone retweets it, the retweet information goes on the front, and some characters are going to get dropped off the end. Okay? But we'll worry about how to deal with that um, later on. The other things which are, are quite useful, the entities can be quite useful. I'll, I'll show you an example of using the hashtags later on. And there's the re in reply to's are useful when you've got to reconstruct conversations. I said that's made a little bit easier nowadays, but, but previously that would have been essential stuff to have. But when we get, oops. <sighs> As I get down towards the bottom, you get some stuff and you think, really, why on earth do I want this? Profile text color, profile background color. There's a whole host of things in any tweet at version 1.1, which really you'd struggle to find a use case for. Vastly improved with the latest version because you ask for specific things. I don't think there's actually any way of asking for the profile background color. So that's almost disappeared completely. But all the important ones which I've been mentioning, they're still all typically available and easily accessible. I mentioned academic accounts. Um, how they differ from a normal version two account is your 50,000 tweet limit goes up to 10 million. But like I said, don't get carried away because you can find yourself filling that up. Um, perhaps a, a better perk is the fact that you get access to the full search capability. Um, in the previous version, you could, if you wanted um, a, a um, someone's timeline, you got 3,200 most recent tweets. If you wanted to search for a, a term or tweets from a specific person, you could do that, but it would only search back seven days, which is, clearly potentially a problem. Now, if you've got an academic account, you can actually use the full search. So given that you can couple that with um, start times and end times, you can effectively extract tweets going back to whatever, 2006 or whatever Twitter started. Um, the, well, sort of downside, but expected, I suppose, is that you need to apply and be accepted for an academic account. Um, so how do you go around doing that? Uh, well, I <laughs> keep mentioning, yes, you do need a Twitter account before you start. Um, there's a, a, com a relatively short online form, three or four pages, I think it is, and then you have to wait for a day or so, I would hope that you get one. Um, I don't know what the acceptance criteria are, but you are asked about yourself, your own academic credentials and, the pro and your project. The idea is that you have some project either already confirmed or in mind in, in the, you know, going through approval and something like that. And it's gonna need social media data and Twitter data in particular will be very, very good. So you, you've effectively got to make the case of why your project would be better with the Twitter data. But that's not really very hard to do. Hello, there is, um, um, as part of the dashboard, in addition to telling you how many tweet, 
which you've got left in and um, there's a little sidebar which gives you links to um, tutorials and things like that and one of them is a, a forum for the academic um, account and there are some messages in there saying why have I been refused an account so um, it's not impossible to get refused but I've got to admit when I said wait a day I only had to wait a day um, and I got my account um, application progress online age I was going to show you this I'm not going to bother showing you I've already described it you go to to the I want an account it says oh are you an academic you say yes oh would you like to apply for an academic account yes I would and then just lead you through these these three or four pages that you fill in and send off okay so let's assume now that we have our account and we want to um, look at timelines so uh, as I said um, at the beginning, you've got to distinguish between what the API says is a timeline for a user, i.e. 3,200 tweets, and what we think of as a timeline, a chronology of what a user sees on the screen. Okay, So four things we need to consider. What is included in a timeline? what is not included in the timeline. Here I'm talking about the timeline that we can get hold of. Um, what is not included but you can get, i.e. we can add it to the basic timeline, and what's included and you cannot get. If you just bear with me a minute, I'm going to use this technology to pause the sharing and start um, a Twitter account if I can. So what I did, I've just opened up my own uh, Twitter account, which I needed to get the keys. And what you could see is what anyone would see if they open their own Twitter account. So what I've got here is a retweet from the UK Data Service because I follow the UK Data Service. We've got experts in money, which is some kind of advert, nothing to do with me. I don't know why I'm particularly seeing it. That's down to Twitter. We've got some more UK data service stuff. We've got some ONS stuff because I follow the ONS as well. I don't follow very many people. Um, what it will offer you in in Twitter is who you might want to follow. So this is Twitter's idea of who you might be interested in. Um, UK Statistics Authority, because I'm already following the ONS and so on. Another advert from Vodafone and so on and so forth. And I can go down here as long as I want to do. Um, now, the point about this is that anything, any of the tweets from someone I'm following, if they have retweeted them, I will see them. If there's a tweet from the UK Data Service itself, which I think I saw down here, I get them as well. The ONS ones I get, and of course, should I actually tweet something, which I <laughs> virtually never do, um, that would appear in here as well. So the easiest things to get, or, or the things that you can get, are the tweets that um, from your own timeline, i.e. I th things that you have tweeted yourself, and you can see the tweets from your your who you're following their timelines as well okay you won't actually see everything that the uk data service sees you only see the ones where they have retweeted it because a retweet is essentially becomes one of your tweets and i'm following them so i see their tweets but the uk the the, the closer um, uh, um, account. I don't follow that. So I'm only seeing this from closer because the data service has retweeted it. But it means that the data service is almost certainly following closer. So as we go on, I can, when I get the list of friends, I can get the entire timeline for closer and I can work out what the data service would have seen. The other things, obviously, we, we're not going to be able to get at all are things like the adverts. Um, again, no doubt they've got some clever algorithm which decides they think I'd be interested in experts in money. And also the who to follow, again, this is internal to um, to Twitter. These aren't tweets, so we can't get them. Adverts we can't get, tweets we can't, um, 
who to follow up items we can't get. We can only get the things which actually correspond back to an actual tweet, whether it's your an original or something's been retweeted and you've seen it because you're following them. So what we're interested in, what is included, what isn't, um, not included, but you can get, i.e. the other tweets which aren't retweeted from the, your friends. Uh, and what is not included, and you can't get that's the adverts and the um, the recommendations from Twitter. So it's a bit of a pain because they'd be quite useful. That's that's what you'll see that you will what you do see when you're looking at your own timeline. Um, what you can't get the tweets that your friends see and their recommendations and ads, which again may be potentially interesting to you but can't be got. What you can get, we can get all of your own tweets. That's kind of obvious, I think. But you can also get all of your friends' tweets as well by extracting their, their timelines. Uh, what you can't get are deleted tweets, anything from banned accounts, uh, the adverts and the recommendations. We've already covered them. So let's have, oops, an example of Twitter feed. Okay, the example of Twitter feed that we're going to use is we're going to look at the, the data service. Or we have actually just looked at that. Um, I've mentioned software, software stuff before. We're not really going to be talking about software, but I, I've mentioned that, uh, for example, the, the Python Tweepy, which is very popular for Python users, as far as I know, that hasn't been upgraded yet. Um, and there's other ones, Twitter R is very popular in R. Twitter Twark, Python Twark, I'd, I'd actually never heard of, um, but I think that has been updated. And if all else fails, you can always use R, the, the raw API with using Python requests or the equivalent in R. And I'm sure there's plenty more possibilities in there as well. So we're going to look at the UK DS timeline. Why not? Because it's publicly available. Um, basic status is on stuff I've already extracted from them. I can tell you that the the timeline consists of 3,248 tweets, or it did on Sunday, I think, when I downloaded it. Um, if you look at the documentation for Twitter, it says 3,200 tweets. But the reality is you, you tend to get a few more. I, I assume it's some kind of little batches and you get the batch which runs over 3,200. What you can tell immediately from this, uh, if you look at the, uh, the tweets, they come back in reverse chronological order, i.e. the most recent first. So if I go down to the last tweet that came back, I can see that it was in 2018 on the, the um, June the, the 5th. Okay, the format of the time are pretty universal standard formats and from knowing that and how many tweets i can work out simple arithmetic they're doing an average of 3.1 tweets per day now the tweet rate itself you may think well well is, is that a significant statistics i doubt that but there are situations where tweet rates can actually cause you a bit of a problem when you're doing this not so much now but certainly an earlier version of the API, it was a problem. Um, just more about what I extracted directly from the, the, the timeline. Oh, in fact, this information here comes from the user information about UKDS, which again, publicly available. And although it's not actually part of the timeline, I would recommend that if you are getting a timeline for um, all of the friends of the data service, it's worthwhile getting their user information as well, because not least it will give you a description of that user if they filled it in and it will also tell you the same information i've taken here from the data service um, how many original tweets they made retweets quoted tweets and replies they're the four categories of tweets now most tweets are retweets and original tweets the split between the retweets and the original tweet will depend largely on the type of user um, as I mentioned before, I don't think I've ever tweeted, I've very rarely tweeted, but then equally, I never retweet either. Individual users are far more likely to um, offer original tweets and might occasionally retweet something if they find it particularly interesting. If you take an organisation like the data service um, and other public service 
type organizations, the chances are they are going to, yes, they will have their own set of, of retweets, a, a big fan of original tweets, for example, telling you about webinars and all this sort of thing in, term, in the case of the data service. But a lot of, of what they do will be retweets. So finding that they've got this ratio of about three or four to one is, is perhaps not unusual because part of what the data service is doing is just providing a service to the people who are following it. And so they will, they in their 3,000 odd followers, they will have people like the ONS and lots of other data services and what have you. And they will selectively retweet some of those to provide the, their followers, of which are about 10,000, um, information so they don't have to follow individual people. Or well, that's the idea. It, it, it's a service that they're providing. So having um, a lot more retweets and original tweets isn't really a sign of them. Uh, of a lack of original stuff to say, it, it's it's them actually providing the service that they do. So the significance of the tweet rate, the higher the tweet rate, and this is common sense, I suppose, means that the shorter time span of something in the timeline. So if you're limited to 3,200 most recent tweets, the faster the tweet rate, the 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 less amount of time you'll actually have in in the um in the timeline and then for things like um, bbc and, and news agencies it could be as short as a couple of weeks okay so the consequence of this used to be at version 1.1 is that you had to be able to collect them promptly because if they fell off the end got pushed off the end by new tweets you couldn't really get them because if, if we're assuming two weeks, if they've been pushed off the end, even doing um, individual searches isn't gonna, wouldn't help you at 1.1 because you can only go back seven days. So the timing of the collection of the tweets is, can be quite important. Um, not so much now because, like I say, if you've got an academic account, you've got access to the full search um, API and you can go back as far as you need to go. So you can collect them retrospectively if you need to on the, on the new system. A specific example, uh, the DICE project, which is a project I worked for, or I work for still, huh? um, we want to get the complete timelines from 905 um, survey respondents who, who've willingly given us their um, Twitter IDs. So when you look at the 905 complete timelines, that makes, gives me a total of 300,030 unique friends timelines because it was in fact a total of 450,000, but of course some of them have the same friends. So the first, first step in such a situation is to don't download the same timeline twice. But even at 300,000, it took me over 16 days to collect them all. So going by that previous slide, if the last one to be collected was a news agency, which is cycling over every 14 days, I wouldn't have the complete um, timeline. It, it would have completely been overwritten from my starting to collect them to when I finished collecting them. And there's not much you can do about that other than having multiple pe people trying to collect them at the same time. Like I say, not so much a problem now with version two academic account because you can specify specific time periods um, with a, a given account. All right, collecting the data. What we need to collect is the UKDS timeline itself, which we get, we can get directly. We need to get a list of the UKDS's friends, which again, you can do directly using the API. And then we get to get the timelines of all of the UKDS friends. And as I've mentioned before, although it's not actually part of the timeline, it is useful to have the user details of the, the data service and of the friends. Um, I've got an example of what you actually get in the friends, which I'll share with you in a minute. Okay, so hopefully you can now see my little um, UKDS friends spreadsheet. And basically this is just a flattened version of what comes back when you say, give me all the friends that the data service has. If I go down to the end, oops, go down to the end there, you can see 3,356 of them. Okay. 
go back to the beginning, you get an idea of what information you get. So right at the beginning here, I've got the IDs. These are the Twitter IDs of the friends. And I'm going to need that list of IDs in order to get the timelines, because that's what the timelines are based on. You, you ask for the timeline for the ID. You get the information, you get the description. Now, this is user provided information, so it's whatever they put in there. Most of these are filled in. Some people, you don't have to put it in, so you don't have to. <laughs> Just notice this one here currently off Twitter. So, um, lots of other little information. Um, you get the followers count, you get the following count, and you get the tweet count. So, the tweet count uh, can be used to work out the tweet rate in, uh, I've got that, I've, I've done this in yellow because this isn't provided, this is the bit I've included into this table, but you can work out the tweet rate. So you can see up here, I'm pretty sure this is the BBC News um, user, and they've got a very high tweet rate. This is 86 tweets per day on average, okay? Um, other little bits of information you may or may not want to use, probably nothing much else in there okay but some of the basic stuff like the counts and the descriptions are, are very useful to have the ids are essential because that's the basis of getting their, their timelines um, this is just an example of part of the the, the data service itself share which of course um user information which wasn't in the list of friends, but we want this as well. So it's exactly the same thing. And this is sort of how it comes back from the API itself. So you can see here, I've got the followers count and I've got the friend, the following count, which is the friends uh, and various other little bits of information. So, so I used the 10,535 and the created that date to work out the, to work out the tweet rate. Oh, just a little more word about Trump, as we we just happened to come across one of his tweets before. Um, okay, what do we know about this guy called Trump? Controversial tweeter. Um, I, I've, I've always wondered why people who, well, we refer to tweeters and not twits, but never mind. Um, but controversial tweets, yes, but that's that's just free speech. That's okay. You get warning, you started getting warnings on some of his tweets. Um, and that's really the opinion of the fact checker or, or Twitter themselves. But what's or possibly more important about this is we've got no way when we collect the tweets of getting that information. If you are looking at it on a timeline, if you followed Trump, when it, those tweets came up and they put warnings on them, you would see the tweet and you'd see the warning. But now, um, but if, if you're using the API, all you get is the pure tweet, not the bit which is like overlaid on top of it. Uh, if a tweet is removed, then you you can't see it and you can't download it from the API. So if you try to search for, even if you've got the tweet, you knew what the tweet ID was, it wouldn't help you. It wouldn't come back in the search. It doesn't come back and say, oh, no, that guy's banned. It just returns nothing. And when he actually got banned, then he came a non-person to Twitter, so you can't download any of his tweets, even the ones which were just mildly controversial. He's a non-person to Twitter. And this actually has a, another effect, which you may not immediately think is obvious, but if he's a non-person, yes, it's obvious that you can't get his tweets, but his ID is removed from the friends list of his 85 million followers. So what that means in, in terms of, of the project I'm working on, our 905 um, uh, volunteers, if you like, where we had their Twitter timeline and we had their list of friends, if any of those were following Trump, given that we didn't get this list of 905 until mid-January after T Trump had been banned, his ID was removed from their list of friends. So when I first got these list of friends and I said, oh, I wonder how many people are following Trump, I found that none of them were because they'd all been removed. Which meant we had to get the list of 88 million and then try and put them back into, to, into, his, into the 905 where it was relevant. So it's a bit of a pain and it's certainly not some, I think we were all expecting Trump to get banned at the end, but we didn't realize that this would be 
a consequence of it not being able to, or have, having his ID removed from his list of friends. Um, obviously, if you downloaded Trump's tweets before he was banned, you still have a copy of them. Brings us back to what data do we want to keep? Um, as I've mentioned, in, in version two of the API, this is a decision that you have to effectively make in advance because apart from a, a couple of defaults, you have to ask for anything that you want. Um, I mean, it's not individual fields, they're groups of fields, but you still have to ask for them. And whereas as I said in 1.1, you used to get everything and it was really a case of deciding what you wanted to get rid of after the, after the fact, if you like. Um, but in both cases, there are some key fields which you're almost certainly going to want to keep. So here's a little little table of some of the fields. Um, I think these are actually all of the, well, it's probably not all, these are all of the ones I collected from um, the version 2 API. I could probably have had more if I'd wanted them, but I didn't. So again, we've got the, the usual suspects of the text, yes, the author ID, the account that generated it, the ID itself created that, the conversation ID, that's a new version two, and I say we can use that to recreate, well, recollect all of the tweets related to a specific conversation. So that, that a conversation would cover things like um, a multi-part text uh, a tweet. So when you split the tweet into three parts or something like that, then they'll all have the same conversation ID. And so you can easily get them all back together. Oh, well, you can collect them all. You have to put them back together yourself. Um, the reference tweets, this is um, telling me that um, the tweet itself refers to another tweet. Other things which you're likely to want are things like the entities, the, the mentions and hashtag entities, um, because they can be very useful for doing analysis of various types. Um, the public metrics, these are the ones which I showed you before, the retweet counts, the reply counts. Uh, well, I showed you the, the equivalent of these for the users. These are the, the values for this particular um, tweet that's coming back. Um, entity URLs, again, that can be useful. There's a little bit of a gotcha on that, which I'll cover later on. Um, in reply to user ID, yes, again, you might want to have that. So some are definitely essential, quite a few you'd want. But overall, this is a, quite a manageable list compared to what you used to get. So I think I'll tend to just take them all and, and ignore them if I don't need to use them. Okay, so next step is timeline reconstructed. How are we going to do this? Right, step one, we're going to get the target timeline. So that's the UK data service, okay? That's a, a single call saying, I want the timeline from this user. We can also get the list of the data services friends. Again, that is a single call. That's changed slightly from version one and version two. You used to just get an ID for each of the friends. Now you get a little bit more information, so it's a little bit more involved, but essentially you need the list of friends to get the IDs to go on to step three. We're going to get the timelines from the friends. And that's essentially exactly the same step as step one, except that we substitute the data services um, ID with each of the friends in turn. The next thing we want to do is I'm going to come back to this point in a minute. Combine the data and the include sections of the timeline data. When the, the data comes back, it's broken down into various sections. The majority of the data information that you want is going to be in the data section, but the includes section um, is also needed, especially if you've got retweets. And as you don't know in advance if something's going to be a retweet or not, you're always going to ask for the include section to be provided. Having combined the data and the includes, the next thing we want to combine by appending, you know, one to the bottom of the other of all of the timelines. And by all there, I mean all of the friends plus the target timeline of the data service as well. Now, as I said, step three here is exactly the same as step one, except I've changed the ID. The combine, that's going to be the same for everyone. 
this is going to be the same for everyone. So everything will combine quite happily together, append together, because they're all in exactly the same format, because it all came back from the same types of core. And then you probably want to sort by the date or the ID um, to put them in chronological order. You can have the forward or backwards, it doesn't really matter. Um, date or ID will both work because the dates are unique and the IDs will be unique. That's the, the, the tweet ID here. Um, going back to point four, comparing the data includes sections. If a tweet was a retweet, then you need the data in the include section to get the full text of the tweet. Okay, I pointed out um, when we're looking at uh, the tweet data that the thing it says as text or full text is what it thinks of as that particular tweet. But if it was a retweet, what you really what, what the real full text is is the text of the original tweet and the original tweet will be included in the include section. So uh, also what you'll get is an indication of whether or not it was a retweet um, or, or not. So the idea is in order to collect the full text of the tweet, you need to say to yourself, if it's a retweet, then I want the text taken from the include section. If it wasn't a retweet, then the text from the original tweet will be the full text. Okay, and and that is exactly the same. It was very similar to what it was version one point one as version two. The actual approach is slightly different, but but it's the same logic of if it's a retweet, then take it from. Don't, don't trust what it says in the full text of the tweet. Go to the includes or or wherever. And it's the same argument if you're going to be dealing with the entities. So these are the, the hashtags, the, the it's meant to say mentions and URLs. If it's a retweet, you need to get the entities, oops, entities from the include section rather than the actual original tweet, because these may have these will have um, the full set of entities rather than what was available in the rather truncated tweet. Timeline itself, it's, it's just a, a chronological list of events. I sh I'll show you what the timeline looks like because it's incredibly boring. Okay, so this, is, this spreadsheet is the reconstructed um, timeline of for the data service, um, going up to the 16th of, of the 4th. Um, in fact, when I did the friends, I didn't do the complete friends timeline. I just did it for the last previous week. But down here, I mean, all of these, if I move down here, you'll see the um, author ID X here. This is, the X is just because I've combined two data sets together. They don't really mean anything. Uh, but you can see here the author ID, it's, it changes as I go up and down because I'm starting off with um, the data service. It's probably easier if I show you the other end where I've got the actual names, I think. So you can see here, I've got a username for the data service. And as I go down here, oops, you can see all of the friends where I've, I've collected tweets from. Yeah. Now, all of these individual tweets, um, would have been seen on the data services um, on screen timeline, but only the ones that they retweet would their friends see on their timeline. Okay, so this is the complete picture, but it and from this we can decide well which ones did they retweet and which ones did they not retweet, and that in itself might tell a whole story, um, depending on what you're trying to do. But this is the complete list. Now, if you consider here, I've got the complete data service timeline and about a week's worth of their 3,000 um, friends timelines. Um, you can see I'm already up to nearly 6,000 rows here. So if I'd had all of the data from all of the timelines, it would be a very large data set. Um, I was... The other thing I was going to show you in the tweet, these are the, the friends tweets. And you can see here the tweet count. Um, I think if I just do the tweet count in smallest to largest order, 
you can see that there are some people who the data service are following who have never tweeted. And this is actually quite common. People have accounts and they never actually use them. And if I do it the other way around, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, some of them, of course, like the BBC, are very prolific in, in the amount of tweets that they do. Um, so even though you're collecting someone's timeline, there may in fact be nothing in it. So chronological sequence of events, and the, the really, the next step is it's up to you. It's going to depend on what it is you're trying to get out of this. So I've just got a few little examples, I think. Oops, oh, just before we move on, conversations and responses. I've mentioned these um, before. Um, if you're going to do any kind of text analysis, you'll probably want to make sure that you've got the conversations recombined. Um, conversations don't just cover I said, he said. It can also cover um, multi-part tweets, which will allow you to put them, to help you put them together. Because if you're doing kind of text analysis, I assume that you'd want to work on a complete tweet rather than three parts of the same tweet. Um, and so it does help you with the conversation endpoint, but you, you still have to do some of the work of assembling it yourself. Timeline analysis, um, what do you want to do? Have you kept the data to do it? Do you need additional software or data? Now, the, the first, I think we've probably covered the, well, you've got to know what you've got to do. Kept all the data to do it. Well, in terms of the, the Twitter API, as I say, version two, you're probably better off just collecting everything and keeping it uh, because it's not nearly as bulky as version one. Um, do you need additional software or data? Well, if you're doing timeline analysis, yes, I could do little graphs of uh, changing tweet rate over time and things like that. But it seems more likely that I'm going to want to do an analysis of the timeline um, based on external events which are known to happen. So for example, um, I don't have the example, but if we were looking at um, tweets on a given, not, not so much a person's timeline, but tweets on a given subject, like um, some election type subject, then if, some, if something happened in the news about that subject, you'd expect to be a spike in, in the number of tweets. And it's the same for this sort of thing. So um, for example, if you were just looking at someone's personal timeline, um, you might get a flutter of tweets coming and going around their birthday or Christmas and things like that. But you'd have to, so the question is, could you work out their birthday? And, well, everyone does Christmas, but could you deduce their birthday from the timeline of uh, tweet rates and things like that? Of course, you'd have the data as well, the text as well, that probably makes it easier. Uh, but the other things where the text isn't going to help you and you're interested in how tweets change over time. So for example, if someone, one of your, one of the people you are following started tweeting a lot, do you retweet what they say or not? Things like that. Change of tweet rate, yes. Trending, so I sort of mentioned that external hashtag. So that's, that's the example where you would need additional information to know what was actually trending to see if it's reflected in the timeline that you're looking at. Uh, retweeting new and different sources, I've just mentioned that one as well. Sentiment analysis. So this is dealing with the actual text of the tweet. And uh, personally, I, I have a lot of difficulties with sentiment analysis uh, on tweets um, because of the following reasons. One, you've got very limited text. Even oops, sentiment analysis. Um, it's tricky with the limited text. And when you consider not only have you got a maximum of 280, people are putting hashtags and mentions and URLs in there as well. Um, so you've got less text to work with. Um, then you've got things, uh, the problem with emojis, how they treat it. And then we've got irony and sarcasm, which I think is, um, I I've yet to see anyone have a, a, a good, um, system for dealing with irony and sarcasm when it comes to sentiment analysis. Oh, small demo. Quick pause while I bring up the demo. Okay, I said these are going to be small demos. So what I've got in this spreadsheet, I've got the text of the tweets, either the data service tweets. And what I'm using is a little Excel add-in. If I go to insert 
adding I am using this as you machine learning up here if you haven't got it you can just download it it's free to download and you can use this to do simple text analysis now it's a bit flaky if i'm honest so I, i've already done it in advance rather than risk it going wrong but the idea is that um you've got the tweet text in column one and then you run the application down here and it will come back with a sentiment in terms of neutral, negative, or positive, and a score. And basically, I think about 0 to 0 0.25 is um, negative, 0 0.25 to 0 0.75 is, is neutral, or thereabouts, and then anything, well, obviously not quite that, but anything higher is what is positive. So it's, it's, it's great, it's calculating a score, and then it's deciding whether it's neutral, negative, or positive, okay? Now, the problem I have with this is uh, I just don't believe it, because if you look at some of these, um, if you read some of these, I'm not going to go through them, but if you actually try and read these and think, well, why is that negative? Why is that positive? And when you get to things um, like this one down here, where half of it is um, mentions and URLs and what have you, you think, well, how can it possibly draw a conclusion well it, it is sitting on the fence in this particular case but but you get the idea it, it can be very hard to do sentiment analysis um i think with with um twitter data so the next thing um oops we can do basic statistical analysis on our timeline so for example um how many original tweets versus retweets if you remember at the beginning i told you that in the the UK data's timeline itself, I, I broke that out for you. Um, the user information, how old the account, the number of tweets, friends and followers. Well, again, we've seen all of those. Um, the user description can be useful. Tweet rate over time. Again, you can do that in a time, um, uh, uh, time analysis. Um, we can do the relationship between mentioned and hashtag to known trends or events. I uh, sort of mentioned that as well um, a minute ago. So I think I've got a couple of graphs here, which I've done using my hashtags. So here I've taken the top 10 hashtags, and this is the UK data service only. So this is before I added in um, the, the other, the, their friends, okay? And so unsurprisingly, UK uh, DS training, UK DS webinars are the largest mention, uh, hashtags, because of course they happen almost on a weekly or multi multiple times a week basis. And below that, much smaller, we've got various other things. Um, UK COVID data dive, we've all got data in the love data week, identity and data, so on. Um, the UK DS Health 20 and Health 19, these are, I think, annual conferences they have. And we've got 19 and 20 in there because if you remember, the data, the, the timeline I got for the data service goes back to 2019. Now, the, the point about showing you this is, is, well, is really, really compared to the next one. These are the top 10 hashtags seen by the UK data service. So these are the, the, the people they are following, i.e. their friends, what, they hash, what they've got in their hashtags. And we can, we can do that, um, okay, for only for the, the week of data which I collected for the friends. But we can do exactly the same process and see what they're all talking about. And you can see just looking at these names down here, BBC papers, tomorrow's papers today, um, BBC football, BBC breakfast, you can see this is reflecting the fact that the BBC tweet an awful lot and they're all being picked up by um, the data service. But if you're following the data service, you'll only see the ones that they choose to retweet. So the next step I could have done is for well, how many of the retweeted ones have the data service or, or, or you know, hashtags for the retweets of the data service. Oh, and that's exactly what I seem to have done. So, so now we're back into um, data service type territory because the, what they're choosing to retweet 
or well, COVID nineteen. That's a we'll just accept that. But things relating to data says there, which is related. Uh, the health nineteen got in. I don't know why the health twenty didn't get in. Perhaps they, they stopped advertising it. I don't know. But again, um, data. Everything's got data in it because that's what they work. With. A lot of longitudinal studies in in the data service. So that's well represented as well. Um, now, okay, we, we sort of know that for the data service, the type of things you do. But this is quite useful for where you don't. You're not quite sure about what. Um, interests a particular um, person or organization whose timeline you're looking at. Uh, the warning about the URLs. Now, I've mentioned the, here, I've used hashtags. I could have done exactly the same with mentions. The little warning about the URLs, um, they're provided in exactly the same format as the mentions and the hashtags are, except you get a little bit more information. You, you get the start and end of just the position in, in the text, which is totally irrelevant uh, really um, the url is the short view url uh, twitter have obviously got their own little system which puts in t.co and then a url and then you also get the expanded url okay so if i was to put this into my browser and that into my browser i would get exactly the same thing okay now the problem with this is is that the short URL is different for the different people who generate it. So previously I could do a count of how many COVID, hash, COVID hashtags there were. Um, do, trying to do a count of this URL will undoubtedly find it's only there once. And similarly, all of the other short URLs probably only appear once. Whereas if I did a count on the expanded URL, I may get more than once, because every time a, U um, a URL is shortened, the actual um, hashed version of it depends on the user and the browser and possibly the application that they're using. So you can't use the shortened URL in the same way as we can use the hashtag or the mentions. You'd have to remember to use the expanded URL. Network analysis, uh, this is probably very popular because you can avoid all of the tech stuff. Um, it's often done for, for, for friends and followers and friends of the followers and so on and so forth, but that gets out of hand very, very quickly. Uh, we can do for accounts um, and hashtag, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, there's lots of additional software products supporting network graphs and social networks is, is a, a subject in its own right. You, you probably know that. So let's just go and show me another little trivial little example. Okay, so here I've got my little spreadsheet up and what I've got in terms of the data, I've got usernames for data service and BBC News. So it's data service and friends. And here I've got the hashtags and I've limited this to the hashtag, uh, uh, to the data range for which I collected the friends data as well. Okay, so make it a, uh, a level playing field. What I want to do is draw a little graph of username versus hashtag. Again, I have, oops, not in there. Um, in my add-ins, there's a free add-in called Jigraph, which I have. It's free to get if you haven't got it and you want it. And this is, it comes up and it looks like this. And it's, it's quite smart because it expects two columns and that's all I've got. And it worked out, oh, column one is called username. Yes. Uh, column two, oh, that must be the hashtag one. I'm saying yes. And then it'll go away and create a little graph for me. Um, it's a directed graph. I think there may be a setting to change that, but for what we want to do, it doesn't matter. Fortunately, it, it it's very very faint but we can expand the graph oops and find sections of the graph I think this is quite a good section if I make this a bit bigger as it grows you can see this is a pretty um, simple tool and there are far far better versions of of this sort of thing available. So as, as I home in into the centers of these um, 
graphs, you can see the data service here. And if I go in a little bit further, you can sort of see all of the things. So data is very prominent, students retiring. So this is really just over a six day period or, or six or seven days. So you can see the things that the hashtag they use over that period. And um, if I try and move the graph over here, you can see COVID-19, all of the arrows pointing to COVID-19 because <clears throat> not only would the data service have mentioned COVID-19, but probably the BBC and lots of other things mentioned it as well. So again, um, it, it, this sort of scale, this little free add-in application to um, Excel, it, it's obviously a bit limited, but hopefully you can see the potential of what you can do with network um, social media graphs. Um, also, um, the actual thickness of the line and colors on bigger systems you can change. So instead of um, having a line, you can use the thickness of the line perhaps to indicate how prominent that connection is and so on. Lots of things you can do with network graphs. Okay, um, final little bit, products, producers and consumers. I sort of mentioned that um, different people have different ideas how they want to use Twitter. So uh, the way I think of it, and this is just entirely my own interpretation, you've got who uses Twitter? Well, friends and family use Twitter, and the chances are they're going to talk to each other. Um, hobbies and pastimes, well, you might be interested in gardening or fishing or whatever, and there's bound to be some Twitter um, sites there that you can go to and get tips from and all this sort of thing. Moving up the scale, we've got the commercial and public services. So this is where the public services, this is where the data service fits in, but lots of um, perhaps local government and things like that would fall into this category as well. Uh, we've got the news outlets, which you know, as we've seen, the BBC is very prolific. But Sky News will be the same and all the others. Um, and political organisations who are very keen to put their message out. But of course, they, they, they have very much have lulls and uh, you know tr highs and lows in terms of when the, when's the next election due, I suppose. So just a little, um, again, this is entirely my own thinking of, of what the categories might be and if what direction the tweets are, are likely to go. So friends and family, you're going to have lots of original tweets and very few retweets. Uh, political um, organisations, from your point of view, are you following them? You're not likely to talk to them very much unless you're particularly politically kind. Uh, you're not likely to send them a retweet. Whereas on the other hand, they're going to make lots of original tweets, very much um, time centred as well, i.e. just before an election. And they're going to make lots of retweets because they, they will plug anything which seems to favour them. Yeah, and the rest of the table is just a, a various combinations of what is likely to happen, um, and that, that, that's sort of important because um, it, it affects the the um, I was going to say skewness. That's not the right word, but it's going to affect the, the weighting of one type of tweet in um, a complete timeline as opposed to others. So if you take the example of, of the dice situation, where we we be oops. We've been following political organizations in the, in the US and we've got our 905 ordinary people. Well, the timeline of those 905 is going to be very different to the, the political organizations and the news outlets, which we would also follow, which we're going to effectively want to have to combine together into a single timeline for any one of our 905. We've got to take them. If they're following a political organization, we need that timeline. If they're following news outlets, we need those, those timelines as well. And we need to put them all together and, and then interpret what we find. So in summary, um, you've got to have a plan, especially now where you've got to say what you want in advance. Uh, you also want to have um, Reusing a plan could be as simple as changing the account name. As I pointed out, the steps you take, it's exactly the same for the original timeline as it is for all of the friends in that timeline or for that person in timeline. You've got to remember the timeline set is just a data and it's a very boring data set, really. You have to turn it into information. So decide what it is you want to do and make sure you've got all the right bits for that. 
Uh, there's much pre-built software to help you with this, with the techie bits. So all the things like, um, uh, as I've mentioned, you get packages which will help you with the API, download stuff for you, get around the, the rate limits and so on. If you want to do sentiment analysis or whatever, there's lots of um, text analysis programs out there. You can send it up to the cloud, to Azure and, and AWS. And there's even probably even more social network applications around, like uh, NetworkX in, in Python, um, Gephi, which is a free program you can put on your desktop.